This video brought to you by Manscaped. Right now, 20% off plus free shipping with code FILMENTO20. Wednesday, April 20th. Last couple uploads have been low on views. My YouTube channel seems to be losing steam. The channel is my only concern. I don't care what happens to me. I need to push myself, master the element of clickbait, find a topic that draws people in. And I think I may have just found it. After being delayed for what felt like forever, the Batman is finally here to give us a new version of the Cape Crusader we've all been looking for. A self-destructive emo who'd rather leap off of great heights and perish than simply talk about his issues with someone. You're not my father. And despite the insanely high expectations this movie was forced to carry, it seems to have lived up to them quite a bit, at least in the book of Filmento. Here's a picture of me when I saw the first trailer at home, here's a picture of me when I saw the movie in IMAX. Which isn't that surprising, because in addition to drawing inspiration from edgy 90s rock music, I don't care what happens to me. The movie also borrows very heavily from two main cinematic sources. The governmental conspiracy of greed and corruption at the heart of Gotham City draws from 1974's Chinatown, whereas the grimy murder mystery detective angle takes quite a lot from the 1995 movie that arguably defines the genre, Seven. And when I say the Batman takes quite a lot from Seven, I actually mean because you'll find all kinds of connections and similarities all over the place. From the dark, detail-obsessed Fincher-esque visual aesthetic, to the negligent disorder that plagues the world, to the cuckoo serial killer whose cave-like upstairs apartment has a red door, and so and so on. My life has been a cruel riddle I could not solve, suffocating my mind. My head began to hurt from his banality. I almost didn't notice it had happened, but I suddenly threw up all over. 2,000 notebooks on these shelves, and each notebook got thousands of pops. Back when the first trailer for the Batman released, I actually made a video on Seven where I tried to find the key murder mystery components that made it so fantastic, in hopes that this movie would learn from them. In terms of the murder scenes, in terms of the city the murders affect, and in terms of the personal intimacy of the murders. A lot of these things the Batman did indeed follow, down to the decimal. <laughs> But at the same time, there's also stuff that it for some reason handled very differently. And so today, what I thought would be interesting to do is to look at the Batman in the context of my earlier points about Seven to see where it coincides as well as where it differs and what those differences result in. Here's how to succeed at Seven, or in other words, how to succeed at a dark murder mystery detective thriller. The first key murder mystery strength of Seven is the way it treats its crime scenes as a puzzle piece story in need of solving, in terms of what happened and who it happened to. The first half of this is that coming into the crime scenes, our heroes don't know what has happened and need to put together all these tiny clues to figure it out, like with the gluttony victim. The cockroaches indicate lengthy, inhuman conditions. The excessive spaghetti and spaghetti sauce indicate a repetitive activity. The binds indicate an absence of free will. The bucket of vomit indicates pushing beyond limits. The barrel mark in the head indicates just that. All of these small pieces come together to form the big picture of what took place. Killer put a bucket beneath him, kept on serving. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have ourselves a homicide. The other half of this is that the victims themselves are presented in such clear context that we understand exactly what they're supposed to represent. The victim inside a giant upscale city center office building who gets immediate mainstream coverage promising swift justice. Very best men on this. The sin there is very apparent. The victim inside a dark horny dungeon who dies in a horny act. Oh God, get this thing off of me! Get this thing off of me! The same thing. All the victims are distinguishable individuals that clearly convey the message that their murder is meant to convey. Call for help and you'll live, but you'll be disfigured. Or you can put yourself out of your own misery. And the first half is where you'll find the Batman's biggest difference, because instead of treating its murder scenes as puzzles, it uses them to build the murder. <laughs> Essentially, Batman doesn't really investigate crime scenes as much as he shows up to them late to hear what has happened. Love force trauma. Injected him with arsenic. Edward Nashton works at KTMJ. He's a forensic accountant. Which is unavoidable because you can't really make a puzzle out of something the audience has already seen. Got hit a lot of times. And hard. Oh, really? <laughs> Batman does solve a lot of riddles, but again, not by finding clues to the answers, but instead by just saying the answers. The answer's just as you are 
Yeah. He's only got letters from he lies down and leave the rest oh. Even the tiny bit of crime scene work that he does do doesn't really matter because he still needs someone else to tell him the missing pieces instead of finding them on his own. Killing Mitchell with a friggin' carpet tool to a tucker. Okay. What? You did it? You must have cheated. But the upside to this more straightforward approach is that you get to do more with your bad guy. See, the more we see the Riddler violently attack people, the more we start to perceive him as this super audacious, confident, animalistic, physical barbarian. And now that we've built that perception, the movie can turn it upside down by proving him to actually be anything but. Count. Right, so turns out that the physical barbarian we've been watching is actually just a 15 year old adult man, which gives him these extra layers, because he's not really like, as we've seen, as much as it's just a self convinced illusion. My mask allowed me to be myself completely. No shame, no limits. Point is, there's more to Riddler than meets the eye, whereas with John Doe in 7, what you see is what you get. Because aside from his work, you don't really see him or get a clear up close sense of him as a person until the end. There's nothing yet there to be turned upside down. He could have turned out to be an actual young kid and it wouldn't have changed anything. You're looking for me. Hey! Get away from him! And it's that duality built for Riddler that ultimately makes him very different. And so, when making a murder movie, you need to decide whether to make the crime scenes more about the murders or the murderer. The Batman's choice to focus on the latter works great, but at the same time, it could be cool if in the sequel the crime scenes are more about clues, in a way that we don't fully know who the main murderer villain is until we toward the end put all those clues together. Penguin was in the room, but these prints prove he was here after the murders were committed. If he didn't kill Black Mask, who did? <laughs> The victim half here though is very similar, because each victim gives contextual puzzle piece clues about the larger point behind the murders. When the mayor has been killed, Batman follows evidence down to his garage full of fancy cars. Damn which creates a sense of abundant excess that is important for later as we get deeper into the corruption conspiracy. When the police chief gets killed, it happens in the police precinct. Commissioner Pete Savage, he was found dead earlier tonight inside the police athletic league facilities. He'd always like to work out late at night when no one else was around. Which creates a sense that even the police is penetrable. There's ultimately no actual police involvement in the kill, but it does make us realize that even this building meant to represent justice and safety isn't able to be that as is useful for later. When the DA gets a bomb in his neck, he refuses to talk to save his life despite the coward he's been built up to be. No, he's gonna kill you. I'm a dead man either way you're talking to a dead- Which creates a sense that whatever's going on, it is a big deal. As in, the Riddler doesn't just kill people, but instead each of his victims conveys something new in regards to what the killing spree is about. I guess it's good to be the mayor. The main point is that you should treat your crime scenes as stories to build our perception of either the murders or the murderer and the victims' places in the larger context. The second key murder mystery strength in Seven is the living, breathing city. Essentially, the city is presented to be this sinful cesspool dominated by crime and apathy as the murder spree aims to prove, which is also backed up by showing it in action. If you want to see crime, just take a cab ride. If you want to find negligent apathy, just go to a crime scene. Wait a minute, no one bothers with vital signs? This guy's been sitting in a pile of his own pisses. If he wasn't dead, he would have stood up by now. If you want to feel local honest hospitality, just buy an apartment. Real estate guy. I'm still wondering why will he only bring us here for five minutes at a time, yeah? We found out the first night. Like very clearly, there is a problem here that requires some form of a solution, just as John Doe is trying to convey. You like what you do for a living? These things you see? No, I don't. But that's life. That's life! On top of which, the city also isn't in a bubble, but exists as its own real thing outside the story, which we see by visiting a lot of everyday city places, from cafes to libraries to civilian apartments to pizza shops, and by interacting with a lot of everyday city residents, from shopkeepers to bystanders that we need to fake at testimony. You got a sign, huh? Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, aside from seeing it, all you have to do to know that this place has a life of its own beyond our journey is open your ears. Lust and envy. Seven, hold on. 
that's not even my desk. And in a very similar way, Gotham City in the Batman is presented to be this decaying cesspool of crime and negligence and corruption, which in the same manner is also shown. For example, the movie begins with a Halloween night montage where we get to see Gotham's out of control crime problem in action, from robbery to vandalism to a gang initiation assault. None of this advances the plot, but it's still incredibly important to prove that, yeah, Gotham does indeed have a problem that needs fixing. Multiple ones, in fact. There's a problem with illegal substances, which we get glimpses of at every point in the supply chain, even at the very end. Drop it. There's a problem with poverty and orphans, which we see firsthand by visiting the very place that was meant to represent a fix. Talking about the old orphanage, part of the Wayne estate. They donated it. It's one that burned down. There's a problem with corruption, which we experience by, for example, infiltrating this shady exclusive club that mixes the mob with politicians and police. A club that, by the way, is shown through very dreamlike blurry vision, which adds to that dreadful, uncomfortable sense of corruption that there's shadowy danger everywhere. Even though in reality, it's just a poor old DA. Oh, you need a ride? I'm good. I hope. Uh... is that when the movie establishes problems with Gotham, it doesn't just leave them up in the air, because that would make the whole killing spree to expose them just artificial and empty. No, just like in Seven, we know for sure that there is something wrong, and the main question then becomes more about what is the correct solution, the one the killer is proposing, or something else. And in addition to just problems, the movie also builds Gotham as a real place by giving it a life beyond our journey. It can be something tiny, like Batman driving past piles of trash and homeless people downtown. It can be something a bit larger, like a crowd of displeased protesters gathering outside the mayor's funeral. Or it can be in your face, like an unknown resident talking to Bruce Wayne in a somewhat foreshadowy manner. It's just another rich scum sucker. He got what he deserved. Know what I mean? It's just about how much time you're willing to spend to turn your intentions into tangible form. In The Dark Knight, for example, the finale was about ordinary Gotham residents deciding their own fate. And it was a bit weird because we'd never really met any ordinary Gotham residents, because we'd only ever been in these high-scale penthouses and banks and government parades and courtrooms and expensive restaurants and exploding hospitals and secret mob meetups and China. Like, why does Batman spend more time in China than he does in the everyday part of Gotham City with ordinary people living their ordinary everyday lives? That doesn't really help this. In a sense, if you want to build a real city for your murder spree to concern and take place in, you have to get down and dirty into the everyday specifics of the city. I'm sure there's a two-hour version of the Batman where all the quote-unquote unnecessary stuff is cut out, but I doubt that the meaning behind the murder mystery would have been able to survive without it. The third key murder mystery strength in Seven is the way the murders ultimately become very personal. Essentially, after 90 minutes of piecing together these killings that don't carry any intimate value to our heroes, the man responsible, John Doe, just shows up. Hello there. Which then leads to the heroes taking John Doe on a field trip to find his last two victims. And at this point, the audience's imagination is running so wild that there's no way to live up to it. If we catch John Doe, he turns out to be the devil. I mean, if he's Satan himself, that might live up to our expectations. Except that the finale does. It's one of the most powerful finales you'll find, because it goes as intimately personal as humanly possible. Stay away from here now. No, 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 come in here. Whatever you hear, stay away. John Doe has the upper hand. What? Uh, what's in the box? Not taking, give me the what's gun. in the box? Give me the gun. He just told you. You lie! Yeah. And the finale is where the Batman differs from Seven, because instead of intimacy, it goes more for spectacle. Basically, after unmasking the corruption in Gotham at the end of the second act, Batman manages to take down Riddler as well. But then he realizes that Oops. Riddler has a plan in place to flood Gotham and then have his followers shoot the new mayor and evidently some other people as well. And then Batman goes there to fight those guys and there's some really cool action. Oh. and then he saves the day, the end.
There are some moments of more intimate emotion here, like when Catwoman gets strangled and Batman juices up and intervenes to the point of almost losing himself, but not nearly the same extent as in Seven. We don't quite get to that same level, which is a testament to the sheer power of emotional intimacy that no amount of spectacle can reach. Obviously, it comes down to genre and personal preference, but I do wonder if it would have been more powerful to have a finale where it's just Batman and Catwoman and Riddler facing off around one last twisted riddle that decides the future of Batman and Gotham City. But aside from the ending, the movie does create a lot of bigger and smaller personal elements for the mystery all throughout the runtime. First of all, when Batman checks out the mayor's body in the beginning, he notices this little kid there who just lost his father, kinda like he did. Meaning that now, solving this whatever murder becomes an emotion-heavy metaphor for Batman to solve the unsolved murder of his own parents. Explained during Wayne's own mayoral campaign. It was a shocking crime that remains unsolved. Emotion that grows when Alfred becomes collateral damage in a way that brings in personal stakes. Emotion that grows even larger when it turns out that the death of Bruce's parents is at the heart of the mystery. As in, the further we go, the more personally invested we get in the murder case that initially began as just another murder case. Secondly, the mystery is reflective of Batman's own internal journey, because he and the Riddler are very much the same. They're both mask-wearing vigilantes who patiently spy on their targets with binoculars. They're both messed up orphans who jot down their edgy thoughts into ledgers. They both view themselves as I'm a vengeance. Uh oh. As in, the case begins to make Batman realize his own wrong steps and grow past them. He shouldn't be vengeance, he should be justice. Thirdly, there's a connection between Bruce Wayne and Riddler. Essentially, Bruce's dad, Thomas Wayne, was desperately trying to stop this reporter from running a harmful story on his wife and accidentally got him killed. <laughs> which made Riddler vow revenge because he's the orphan son of that dead reporter. Except, oh wait, that's not actually true, because it would feel pretty forced. No, Riddler is one of the countless Gotham orphans that the Wayne Foundation pledged to care for, who were then forgotten in the cold after the Waynes died. That's why Riddler's mad at the elite, that's the connection between him and Bruce. Sins of the father, sins of the son, who did nothing about them. And everybody just forgot about us. All they could talk about was poor Bruce Wayne. The reason I said it like that is just to highlight that even if you're creating a personal connection, there's more ways to do it than just the most obvious. Not everyone can or should be that person's child. Catwoman being Falcone's daughter does make sense in terms of her actions, but if the Wayne-related heritage just happened to apply to Riddler as well, you're gonna start having believability issues. How do you think that looks? Anyway, the main point I'm getting out of all this is that whatever random murder mystery your movie is about, it shouldn't stay as only that. It should evolve into something much more under the hero's skin for more personal investment, whether it's in form of something from their past or something delivered in a box. That's what Seven does at the end, that's what the Batman does throughout the runtime. That's a significant part of what makes the Batman one of the most effective murder mystery detective thrillers just like Seven. Monday, April 25th. My girlfriend just ran to leave me. Chloe, she says my body's getting too hairy down there. I don't care what happens to me, but the deep urge inside me to not be a virgin anymore never sleeps. And I think I found the solution. Manscaped's Lawnmower 4.0, fresh from the factory. I can use it to shave myself with ease, with waterproofing and LED lights and special skin safe technology. Chloe will not be disgusted anymore. And what a great company, this Manscaped. They've partnered with TCS to spread awareness about testicular cancer that affects men, especially age 15 to 35. Maybe that's why Chloe left just now. Maybe she's worried. Maybe I should care what happens to me. I can follow Manscaped's guide of how to easily check myself to be sure and use their trimmer and crop mops to do it. I'll even get 20% off and free international shipping on the equipment by using code FILMENTAL20. With that done, I'll ask Chloe back. I know she'll come. And then... Hopefully, so will I.